I am very happy to be here. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But, you know, when I was younger and when a lot of us were younger, there was this overwhelming thing that we were promised. And we were promised intelligent computers. We were promised as computers that were going to do our jobs for us. They were going to make it so that we could just sit there and just spend my day with my cat. I love cats. That's all I really want to do is hang out there, pet her, everything's great. But the, the, the intelligent computers never came, so I got to work like a chump. You know, it's 2013, where are, people are like, where are the flying cars? I want the computers that are going to make it so that I can just hang out with my cat. So I figured I had to do it myself. Come up with it, figure out, and all of that. So I found this book. How many people have seen this book or heard of this book? So I found this book online. Now, this is a crazy book. It's 830 pages long. It's a textbook. It's called Handbook of Neuroevolution Through Erlang. And if nothing else, if you have this on your shelf, you are instantly cool. <laughs> right? Because people are going to come over and they're going to be like, what? You're going to be like, yeah. I mean, it's got, it's not like intro to neuroevolution. It's a handbook of it. <laughs> so it's 830 pages. The other awesome thing is that if you buy it online on Amazon, because it's a textbook, you get a $5 Amazon MP3 credit. <laughs> so, in any case, I bought this book to go through. So, my name's Corey Haynes. I'm pretty much Corey Haynes everywhere online. There's a couple other Corey Haynes out there. Um, there's one, uh, a policeman outside Detroit who I often see in like my, the Google alerts that come in, because of course everybody has their name in Google alerts, I'm assuming. And he's always just like busting, busting people. He was part of the canine unit. You know, he's writing white papers and stuff, and I always want to drive by and just like give him a hundred bucks for being awesome, because he's like really a cool Corey Haynes. And there's another one who's a, uh, he, he does um, like Little League or something, which is pretty cool, so I like him too. Um, but me, I want to set a little bit of a stage for this talk, though, because it's about sort of Erlang and your brain and neural networks, and I don't really know much about the brain. I haven't studied it in school. I, I don't really know much, and I'm still a beginner at Erlang. So I'm very honored to be here on, you know, talking on the same stage as people who actually know Erlang. I'm learning it, I love it, all of that, but the one thing that is true is that I love people. So that's more of a picture of me. Um, this talk is really going to be about sort of the basics of what's in this book. Is there work through? Because it's 830 pages and kind of dry and it's really cool and all that, but the chances that you guys are going to read this book are probably pretty slim because it's also $160. And while in college I didn't, you know, I hated paying that much for the book, so that was a pretty typical price for a book in college, but nowadays I see people, I've, I've tweeted out and people are like, 160 bucks, book should be like 20. <laughs> You know, as we're super happy to spend $2,400 on our computers and things like that. <laughs> so, during this talk, what I want to talk about is a little bit about how the brain works, but there is a warning I want to give everybody. Many of my statements here may be apocryphal, <laughs> they may be oversimplistic about how the brain works. In fact, it's probably a guarantee that they're oversimplistic. And probably also as important, they may be slightly wrong. But we're going to pretend I'm on stage. Everything I say gets to be sort of accepted. It's this you know, suspension of disbelief about how the brain works. I'm also going to talk a little bit about how Erlang works in terms of how it might map to the brain, keeping in mind that a lot of the things that I say about how the brain works may not actually be facts. <laughs> but, you know, that's, yeah, you know, it's, 
I believe this is how it works. So that's good. And I'm going to talk at the end sort of a little bit about how to take this neural network that we're going to look at and how to evolve it and actually build our own genius robots. So first off, talking about modeling the brain, like human brains, they're so 1990s. Because we know that nowadays all the cool systems are distributed. So we really, you know, it would be better, you know, it's 2013, how come we haven't cut up our brains and they're all running on, you know, different EC2 instances or something? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But like I said, I don't know that much about the brain. I, I can't imagine it's that difficult. If you do process isolation and everything, we heard that, you know, it would be much more at fault tolerant. So when we get down to the core of it, though, and have this sort of question about how the brain really works, it all boils down to this one thing, neurons. A little bit about very high level thing about neurons is that they look like that. OK, on to Erlang. No, a little bit more. So there's some cool stuff about it, is there's these things called dendrites which are the little army things out there that are sort of the inputs. They're the receptors, um, apparently, of chemicals. Go figure. But the signals come in through your dendrites. And then they go out through this big, long tail called an axon. So you have all of these signals coming in on the dendrites. And then they go out. They all get sort of munged together, and they go out on the axon. This right here is called the axon hillock. It has zero to do with what I'm talking about, but I think it's the coolest named part of the neuron. <laughs> so what ends up happening is you know, cool little electrical signals come in on the dendrites. They get converted over into one signal, and they go out the axon in true awesome animated fashion. And we want to simulate this sort of thing. And as we learned in the video, Erlang loves math. So if we talk a little bit about the mathematical model of how would you take all of these inputs in oh, on our simulated dendrites and then convert them over into something that we can send out the axon. Now, each of the inputs, they're not equal, so you might want signals that come in from one to be given a little bit more weight than one that's on the other. And that's sort of how it merges all of it together and does calculations and things like that. So we're set with this case where we have two vector inputs, which are the signals coming in from the dendrites, and a set of weights for the individual dendrites, how important they are in the final calculation. And we want to convert it into a scalar output, which is on the axon going out. So of course, the question is always, how do you do that? How do you take vectors in, get a scalar out? Bam, dot product. How many people know what a dot product is? Awesome, awesome. So just as an example, if we look. We have, say, these are the inputs coming in on the dendrites. Uh, I forgot to change that word. So our weights are first dendrite gets 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.2. And we go do our dot product, 2 point times 0 0.1, 7 times 0 0.4, 1 times 0 0.2 equals 3.2. It's kind of neat that ordinarily you get kicked out of a theater if you have a laser pointer. <laughs> So anyway, so we get this term of 3.2, but we kind of want to keep our values in between, you know, minus 1 and 1, kind of normalize them. It's a common thing that we want to do. So the usual thing that they do in sort of neural networks and things like that is they use the hyperbolic tangent. Now, I'm a math major, got my degree in mathematics, and I want to do just a brief aside about this. Many of you have heard of the hyperbolic tangent. Because let me tell you, if you haven't, this is the greatest tangent ever. <laughs> Seriously, the absolutely most fantastic tangent ever. Look, so here, I'll prove it to you. Look at this. This is the tangent function. Boring. It's just kind of standing there, periodic, all of that. 
Bam! Hyperbolic tangent. Look at that. <laughs> the hyperbolic tangent, it's laid back. I like to say that the hyperbolic tangent is the Snoop Doggy Dog of trigonometric functions. Because it's just laid back, kicking back. There's probably some gin and juice in there. Chuck Norris loves it. So anyways, back to the top. So if we have our example and then we run the hyperbolic tangent on it, that will get us down to a normalized value, this 0.997. Now, for you know, other reasons abound, but we want to add an extra little value. So we'll go through and figure out, combine all of the values in off the dendrites or on our input vectors. And then we add another little bias because this gives us a, a little asymmetry, something that we can tune. We can fool around with this number if we want to make sort of this, uh, this neuron to have more power in our system. So even though it's got a set weights for all of the dendrites, and the input vectors come in, you always get that same thing out. This will allow us, in a full-blown network where we have lots of different neurons, we can tune individual neurons to have a little bit more weight in the final calculation. So we then might add a little bias to our normalized value. So what comes out then is, is 1.32. Now, this is great because Let's look at how we might model this in Erlang. So we've got like a, a super complete understanding of how the brain works now. So let's take a look at Erlang. So here's Erlang code. I was pleasantly surprised to see that not a lot of people are doing Erlang here. So we'll go through and t talk about this a little bit more. So this is the entire code for a neuron. So if you want to create one, you can come in and call create. R sets up a set of weights. So we do a random, three randoms. Two for the weights. We're going to have two dendrites on this neuron that comes in. It gets two random numbers for our weights right now. And then a third random number, which is that bias, that sort of asymmetry that we can use to make this neuron be a little bit more useful or a little bit more important in our full system. Then, as we do with Erlang, we spawn a process called Neuron and we tell it, I want you to call the loop function when you spawn this process. So you're going to start this process, immediately call loop, passing in those weights. Next, we get to the actual loop function which gets the weights from our create method. We're now in our isolated process. We're running on our own. And we set up a receive block. So what receive does, if you don't know, is it basically sets itself up to wait on the message queue. So receive says block and wait until somebody sends me a message. So even though we've spawned the process up here and we're running, we now sort of lay back and go, OK, somebody's eventually going to send me a message. And when it does, that's when I want to come in here and continue working. So when we do get a message, we expect it to be a tuple to have two things coming in. So the message that gets sent to us is of this form. There's a from which is actually the process ID of the person sending the message to us, and input, which is the two, the two vector, the effectively the dendrites, what's coming in on the dendrites. So we come down, we do a little output, say what we got, because we're gonna, when you run this, it sure is nice if you can see it work, because it doesn't actually do much other than sort of spit out a number, so we can see that we're working. We then calculate the dot product. We run that awesome hyperbolic tangent, get the output, and then we send back to the caller. So the from came in, and it was the process ID of the caller. And we send back to it the output. And we tell it sort of 
one of the things I like about Erlang is it seems like all the messages that gets passed around, it's sort of conventional to put the very first part of the tuple to be a little bit of a descriptor of what this message means or like what this is. So we're sending a message to the from process and we're saying here's the result and then we send it the output. Then we loop. We call back into ourselves to set up another wait. So once we get a message, we process it, then we come back up, loop with the waits, and then we hit our receive block again. And we block and we wait for somebody else. And so we get this sort of step process. And of course, dot products. Here's something that I really, the, the first thing that like, when I saw Erlang for the first time was like, this is the best, is that this right here is one function definition. And so when you define a function like dot, what you do is you provide different function clauses based on sort of the pattern that the parameters are. So if you call dot with a list, a second list, and then this accumulator, it comes down and it calls itself, so it recurses back into itself with the tail of the input list, the tail of the weights list, or the weights, and then it does the dot product. It multiplies the first by the first, adds it to the accumulator, calls back in, and so you're basically stripping off the heads of the two vectors that come in, calculating our dot product, then eventually input is drained and there's no more input, so you have an empty list. Well, Erlang comes down and goes, oh, look at this. Here's my dot. I have an empty list here. I can't separate an empty list into a head and a tail. So let me drop down. Do I have anything else? Oh, look at this. Here's another function clause where the input is empty. So we're going to we're going to execute this code. So we come down, we get that bias in the accumulator, we add them together, return that, everybody's happy. That's what comes back to this dot product. Super cool. Then, since we actually want to have a good way to package up information and send it to our process, since we are waiting up here for something of a very specific form from an input, you don't necessarily want to force your callers to know that this is the form to send it in. So you create a nice API and you tell the neuron or you call this method in your API which is sense, you pass in the, the vector of inputs, it comes in and says are you a list and do you have two things in it because we're, we have two dendrites on our neuron. If you do, then call, see up here, we named our process neuron so we can send it a message with that name passing in ourselves and the signal that was passed in. Then that comes into the receive and everything that we just talked about happens. Then we set ourselves up back on a receive block for when from gets sent the result. We get it, we output it, and then we end. Awesome. Love the way that looks. And here it all is, all explained, so it's all transparent. <laughs> Makes sense? Pretty cool, pretty straightforward. Um, since we've gotten this far as a reward, here's a bunch of pictures of my cat. <laughs> okay, part two. So having a neuron is great. But what we really want is sort of a network. If we're talking about a neural network, talking about how the brain works, the brain doesn't work independently. It has things that generate the inputs, and it has things that the outputs go to, that those, the axon sends to. So we might have some sensors, like an eyeball or a temperature gauge. Anybody follows me on Twitter? They. Uh, Learned a little interesting tidbit about drawing thermometers last night. Um, <laughs> you might have, um, I have no idea what that is. We'll call it a windmill. Um, so these are all things that can generate signals. 
these are sensors from sort of the outside world. Well, they then send over to our neurons, and then the neurons sort of send to each other and they do their stuff like that. And then they send off to our actuators or our outputs, things like your hand. I don't think it's a w I believe that it is the front end of a car. And this, of course, is a gear, right? That's yeah, a gear, so. So these are things that as we get an input, we send it off to the neuron layer, which does all of the calculation, figures out what needs to happen, sends out the signals to the output, the actuators. So if we look a little bit at our sensors, we have our outputs. We have inputs again. We have outputs again. The joys of not actually rem removing the duplication after you do copy-paste programming. Um, so we've got our processes, but what we need is a thing also which is sort of synchronizing it, the thing that says to the input devices, sense. You know, trigger, get all of your data, send it in. You could build it so that it's a continuous stream of data coming in, but for a very simple thing, we can just have it where we have a clock that says read and send the data through. Read, send the data through. So it tells the sensors to sense. So it'll say read it, goes through our process, comes over and of course spins the front of your car. And of course you repeat it. So you just sit there, this cortex, the brain of the system just keeps going bang, bang, bang. So question is how do you model this in Erlang? And that's the end of my talk, thank you. <laughs> no, sorry. So we want to talk about what would be the simplest neural network? What's a very simple one that we can do so that we can actually see how all of these things might work together. We can build the individual components and then work on evolving the solution rather than sort of planning it out from the very beginning. So a single neuron neural network looks like this. You've got your sensor, you've got your neuron, you've got your actuator, the cortex tells the sensor to sense, the sensor picks up say the wind, sends off the message to the neuron, which then does the calculation and sends to the actuator. Does it again. Now the nice thing about Erlang that models very closely is that all of these individual neurons and these individual actuators we can set up as individual processes. If you think about it like this, these are all just messages being passed between different pieces. And our sensor may not have any real sense of what the neurons are doing or how to directly communicate. They just put a messages out there and the neurons handle it. So the parts that we're going to need in order to build this, we need a sensor, which might look like something like this. You got a sensor, give it an ID, this is the cortex, give it a name, you give the things that it sends, the sensor sends its data to. A very simplistic form of the sensor might be something where you give it the single neuron ID, because we're working with a single neuron network. It puts itself into this receive block that we talked about where it's waiting for something to tell it to start. It's waiting for a message. There's a message that we could send it called sync, which in our case constructs a sensory signal since we don't have internet access here. We are just going to create random uniform things. Otherwise this would like go out and do some fantastic sensing on the internet, but we'll just use random uniform right now. We then send a message to the neuron giving us. We're sending it a name. What's the message that we're sending? Well, we're going to send the neuron the forward message and we're going to send the sensory signal to it. Once we send it off, we're going to loop back into ourselves, recurse back, 
set ourselves up on the sync block again. Now the neuron might look similar. It's got an ID. It, it's got a con. It it has a pointer. Well, not a pointer, but the process ID for the cortex that's managing everything. It's got a list of the things that it gets data from. It gets messages from. And it's got a list of the things that it sends its output to. A very simple form of this might be where you are initialized with the set of weights. Here's the sensor that's going to send to us. And here's the actuator that we're going to send to. So as with everything, you set yourself up in a receive block. If the message comes in where there's the sensor ID, the forward message in an input. So if we go back and look, that's exactly the message here. The sensor ID, the forward message, and the signal. So once we get that, we come down, calculate the dot product like we did before, use that. Oh, I, love the, no, I love the hyperbolic tangents the best. <laughs> that's why it's colored red. So then we get our output. We send the self. We send the forward message. We're sort of carrying forward the fact that we're forwarding all of these numbers, sending the output to our actuator. And then we are coming in and recursing back up to set ourselves up, waiting for another message to come in. Very simple. No, nothing really complex. We'll ignore this part. And then the actuator actually looks pretty much the same as the rest of them. You can set it up as a record with an actuator, an ID, and then the things that it comes from. Well, who is it listening to? What neurons are it is it listening to? So when you set up an actuator, you give it the neuron that it's going to be receiving from. You receive. Now, I haven't mentioned this before, but this is a really cool thing about the, the pattern matching in, in Erlang. You might ask, why does the actuator know? the neuron that's sending it information. Shouldn't it, couldn't we just have it where it's spitting out, in, spitting out data? Well, here's, get a load of this. We pass in the neuron ID. When we set ourselves up on the receive block waiting for by, waiting for the message to come in, We've passed in, so say that this process ID is like 7. If we get a message, because Erlang has effectively this single assignment thing, n PID is 7. We saw you can't really, we saw in that video that you can't say x is 1 and then x is 2, because that's crazy talk. So instead, a message comes in, if the first part of our message is not 7. If it's coming from somebody else, we just ignore it. We're like, whatever. I'm not going to do anything with it. So the neuron sends to us, the forward, sends a control signal. We do this puts. There we go. We call puts on the control signal, comes down here, and spits out again. If we had internet access, this would, you know, spin the front wheels of our car, but because we don't, I, it's just spitting out a, a text. Then we call actuator again, loop back, just like everything. This is so awesome. This is why, I mean, Erlang's just beautiful, simple, just does everything right. Our cortex looks like this. We basically initialize it with the sensor IDs, the actuator IDs, and the neuron IDs, and it just basically sits there and waits and triggers. I didn't put, a I didn't put the code up for that because it's just sitting there looping effectively. So that's awesome. We have this simple neural network with one neuron. And while that's super cool, it doesn't do much. It just passes through the data. It runs the dot product, runs the arc or the hyperbolic tangent, not arc tangent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, arc tangent, it's OK. But I was promised a robot. And while a single neuron neural network is cool, 
it's not quite a robot. And it's not really like it doesn't have intelligence. I'm not smart enough to actually build an AI system. Not to disappoint everybody, but I'm not. But what I would like to do is evolve a robot genius from that one neuron neural network. So we can take this. This is our simple one. We have our cortex, our sensor, all of that. The process that we go through is to make clones of this one and mutate it. So true to its form of, e true to its name of evolutionary design or evolutionary algorithms, not really evolutionary design, we mutate it. We take this and we say, ah, well, one of the mutations we could do is add a neuron. Another one we could do is add a sensor. And we just kind of randomly choose from different things that we can do. There's a couple others we could do. We could change what's connected to what, but for simplicity's sake, we'll just say we can add a neuron and add a sensor. Then we have this sort of group of things. We have group of neural networks. Who knows if they're good or not? So we run them. We send, you know, all of the electricity goes through, all the messages go through. And then at the end, we run it again, do it lots of times, thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and then we check to see, oh wow, I really did do it a lot of times. <laughs> lots of times. And then we find the one that worked best. So we're going to say, for whatever sort of definition of worked best, this is the one that worked best. We get rid of the others and destroy them with fire. And then we take this one and say, this is our new, like, closest one. And has anybody seen that awesome uh, instructions on how to draw an owl? Where it's like how to draw an owl and it's like draw two circles and then it's like draw a fucking owl. <laughs> well, and then you repeat this billions of times and you have an evil genius robot. <laughs> And that gets you to your evil genius robot. And that's actually the end. So in any case, that's me. I uh, work at a company called Wavetable Labs. I do a video series that has nothing to do with Erlang. Um, and thanks. Enjoy the rest of the day.